Work, workforce, and workplace norms are shaped as much by popularized portrayals as they are by our lived experiences. From sensational headlines, like The Great Resignation, to successful series, like The Office and Silicon Valley, to skits and stories shared on our social media feeds, what we see shapes what we believe. Let's go behind the scenes to discover what's new now and next in the world of work, and we'll challenge the traditions of what it means to live well and to work well. This is Success From Anywhere. Today on Success From Anywhere, we'll meet a tremendous trio of slackers with a remarkable ability to accurately predict the future. Brian Elliott, Sheila Subramanian, and Helen Cup literally wrote the book on how the future works, a Wall Street Journal and USIA Today bestseller that's the go-to guide based on their future forum research and leadership roles at Slack. Welcome to the show, Brian, Sheila, and Helen. Thanks for having us. Be Good to be here. Because we're talking about the future of work, I like to ask every guest one opening question, which is, what was your first job? And how did that job inform or inspire your career trajectory? That is a great question. What was my first job? Uh, you can count being a teacher, tutor to all of the younger siblings in my family as a first job um, because it feels like that's been my forever job. Um, but being a teacher generally is a theme that runs across um, a lot of my work, a lot of my roles, but also in writing this book um, where I think there's just an opportunity to pull together learnings that I'm having personally as I go through this journey of flexible work along with our team and the executives that we work with. Um, I think it's been a really fun journey just building this blueprint around the future of work from scratch and using the book and our work at Future Forum as a way to teach and help guide that vision for the future. Mine was uh, age 14 as a um, hourly employee, it was my first regular job, at a place called Dairy Snack in Birmingham, Alabama. And I was uh, pulling soft serve ice cream cones uh, in the front. A Dairy Snack, by the way, is a, uh, it's probably a Dairy Queen that lost its franchise license for employing 14 year olds, but we'll set that aside. Um, but what I also did that summer was the um, short order cook would tend to not show up some days. And so I ended up uh, learning to roll up my sleeves, get back there and do the fried egg sandwiches and the other stuff that happened uh, on the morning, on the early day, part of the day shift. And um, that, that, you know, roll up your sleeves up, get it done, uh, contribute, you know, shaped me a lot in terms of how I work, both for the good and the bad as my, as my partners in crime here on the book know. But, um, you know, early work ethic that got instilled, but maybe some issues around balance and boundaries. They probably don't let you cook for them given your, uh, your career start there. I actually have. Yeah, I have. It's pretty, I'm not bad. I'm not as bad as I used to be. Let's put it that way. He's pretty good. Good pizzas. We, we can do more than that next time. <laughs> what about you, Sheila? What was your first job and how did that job inspire your career trajectory? Yeah, so my first job was working on a congressional campaign um, for a woman named Ellen Tauscher in the East Bay area. I was 16 at the time, so I wasn't even legally able to vote. Uh, and I had the glamorous job of stuffing envelopes and calling constituents, encouraging them to vote. And it was actually a really educational experience in the sense that um, when you think about stuffing envelopes, you have to think about how you're folding as well as how you're actually put, stuffing the paper in the envelope to make it as easy of a process for someone to open it up and take the paper out. So it taught me a lot about like craftsmanship and courtesy, even in the smallest details, when it comes to designing experiences for people. Um, also getting hung up on and calling constituents just taught me a lot about listening and getting more comfortable. I'm still working on this with like the awkward silence or that awkward space. Um, and that's helped me a lot in terms of like leading and managing people because listening to people, hearing them out and resisting the urge to actually provide my own opinion, um, was something that I learned at a very early age. Leadership is listening. We talk about 
that a lot. And in fact, I think listening is what inspired the future forum, which might be a new concept for some of our listeners. So let's start by setting the stage with what is the future forum and what inspired you to create it? So Future Forum itself is a think tank backed by Slack, along with our partners at Boston Consulting Group, Miller Knoll, and Management Leadership, Leadership for Tomorrow. MLT is a nonprofit focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And these organizations have, have come together to help us think about uh, two things. One is research. So we do a quarterly pulse survey of over 10,000 knowledge workers around the globe to get at habits and practices and what's working and what's not for people. And we do a lot of executive conversations, forums for small groups of executives to come together in confidential settings and sort of talk about the challenges they're facing, both themselves as, as leaders, but also with their organizations. And the reason why we do all this is the last two years have really created this opening of people's minds to new ways of working that we think could make work better for people as well as organizations. But it requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of leaning into sort of challenging conversations. And so Future Forum sits at the center of that. Our, our job is to enable leaders to build more flexible, inclusive, and connected ways of working. What are some of the topics that are trending now? What are you researching? And are people who are listening able to access your outcomes and your findings? Yeah, we, we've researched a range of topics, um, and we've worked with executives on how to actually implement a hybrid model successfully or what does flexibility look like when it's flexibility in when you work rather than just where you work we've also had conversations around how does flexibility and how does um training work for frontline workers so how do you extend this conversation beyond desk workers and conversations around what inclusion and diversity look like in this new way of work so so the topics have have ranged um depending on like some of the challenges that executive space. So on our website, futureforum.com, we publish insights and blog posts, but we also publish our research that we conduct quarterly in the form of a report, as well as interactive um, data. So encourage those listening to check out futureforum.com to learn more, because we've, we've written a lot about the executive employee disconnect, proximity bias, as well as what is what are the next few years look like for leaders. I'll also add that um, in writing the book, we got started with you know tools and templates that teams and leaders can use to implement future uh, to implement flexible work in their organizations, and that's continued on the website as well. So on top of insights and research that you can find at futureform.com, you can actually. Um, see some of those toolkits and templates that we have available um, so that you can use as well. Listeners might be surprised to discover that in an organization like Slack, I mean, a digital headquarters, a tool focused on making asynchronous connection easier, pre-pandemic, you were extremely office-based and you've been on a journey of discovery of your own. What has that been like? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first on that, and, and y'all ought to ch chime in as well. Slack itself was hugely office-centric. Less than 3% of our workforce was remote. Um, I, I would be sitting in, I led one of our uh, product teams pre-pandemic, our developer platform, and I would sit with our leadership, with Cal Henderson, who's our CTO, Tamar Yehoshua, who's our chief product officer, Ethan Eisman, our head of design. And we had this debate once every few months about, you know, it's so challenging to hire people into New York, into San Francisco, um, shouldn't we open up the aperture more in order to hire more people, especially more diverse candidates in more locations? And it was always one of these things like, it's hard. We would love to do that, but it's hard. We are so used to office-based ways of working. We had so many assumptions about productivity, about innovation, about creativity, about belonging, that it really took the pandemic to even open up our eyes. We got about three months into that, and that conversation changed 180 degrees. In fact, Cal Henderson was the first person to say, I'm changing my policies. Because Cal, who was very concerned pre-pandemic, was seeing that productivity was as high as it ever was. There were huge challenges that individual people were facing that we had to help them navigate. But it wasn't an issue of people couldn't be productive. And then we walked through a second set of challenges around innovation and creativity and how to allow people to communicate and share ideas with one another, even though they were virtual and, and separated, that actually worked out really well. Once those two sort of fundamental preconceived notions had been sort of uh, challenged, 
Cal's mind changed entirely. And it's not just because Cal's a good person, it's because Cal realized that his hiring challenge all of a sudden became much easier. People in North Carolina, in Idaho, in Texas, that he wouldn't have hired otherwise uh, were open to hire for him. It changed not only our ability to hire people, but the diversity of the population we were able to hire. And clearly a lot of organizations have been wrestling this, but it's not been unique. It, it, it's definitely not been one that Slack has been immune to by any stretch of the imagination. I think one thing that, that we did well at Slack is we set principles in our guardrails early on. We talk a lot about this in the book in terms of, it's not about policies. It's about what are what's the purpose behind your, your flexible work? Why? Um, and also like, what are the behavioral guardrails that you, that you want to see and you want to model from the top? And one, one of the principles was embrace the experimental mindset, realizing that this was not going to be something that we were going to get perfect on September 1st, 2020. It was something that we would continue to have to iterate on. And what the conversations that we're having today are going to be fundamentally different from what they are six months from now and embracing this era of discontinuity, discontinuity that we're living in and realizing that we have to constantly be checking in on what's working, what's not, and get feedback from our employees regardless of where they're located. Yeah, I'll add that um, we've been trying some pretty specific programs. Um, so something that comes up often when we talk about schedule flexibility and making that possible is this over-reliance that we all have on meetings as a way to get work done. Um, and that is just a habit that we've all built over time um, in the workplace but it's, it's a habit that's hard to break. And so some of the things that we've been experimenting with at Slack to help teams get out of that meeting mindset are things like Focus Fridays, um, where we take the Friday and make sure there are no meetings scheduled then so that people have focus time um, to do work and get in flow. And then more importantly, um, we also have our sort of async weeks or what we call maker weeks, where for a whole week, the whole company then cancels all recurring meetings, makes more of that space for deeper flow and thinking time. And the nice thing about that is that it, it allows us to audit and take a step back and say, did we actually need that meeting? Can we do things differently? Um, and really helps shift that mindset of meetings as the only mechanism for work. Um, and how can we actually do this better if we do it asynchronously or, um, you know, in a shorter amount of a shorter discussion moment. Um, so those are things that I think as we've gotten further in our journey, we've experimented with more. Does it have to be a meeting is one of my favorite choose to challenge questions. And what I like about your focus Fridays and the asynchronous week practice is that it introduces a pattern interrupt to your point. You know, a meeting is a habit like anything else. And sometimes you need a pattern interrupt to consider whether or not that habit still serves you. And what strikes me about the themes that you're bringing up here about flexible work is sometimes we can all use a phrase like that and have different definitions of what that means. How would you define or baseline flexible work at this point in time? So much of the conversation today is how many days in the office are you required to go back? Or are you asking your teams to go back? So much of the conversation is about where people work, but what we see from the data is that people want flexibility also in when they work. They want to break out of the confines of the nine to five. And so I believe that that's the next part of the evolution of what flexible work will look like is actually questioning and asking why. Why are we having that meeting? Why does it need to happen between these hours? Or why do we need to be expected to be online during these hours? Like, I think there's, there's broader conversations about that. But ultimately, flexibility is about choice. People want to be treated like adults. You're hiring adults, they want to be treated that way. And flexibility is about choice and trust. And I think that there's an opportunity for us to start shifting the conversation around leadership from one about power to one about trust, because that's what people are expecting right now and leaders need to lead with that moving forward. Take us into some of the data you're referencing because you have data that backs this up. In fact, you just mentioned 
we default to applying our mindset and our sort of best thought and all of our attention around this idea of where people work. You said that the data shows that people also want flexibility in when they work. Can you share some of the statistics? I mean, everyone listening is probably trying to build a business case of some kind, even for a pilot to test out some of what you're referencing. Yeah, when we look at the data, um, in our even our latest quarterly pulse report, we saw that 80% of knowledge workers want flexibility in their location, but almost everyone, 94%, want flexibility in their schedule. And the reality is when we look at em employees who are getting more flexibility, they're seeing higher scores across the board for different work factors like 33% higher productivity, two times better work-life balance scores. And it's not hard to see why. Um, when you have more control of your day, you're not in back-to-back -back meetings, you have some more agency and choice um, and more ability to get into flow and, and have focus time, you, you feel better, right? You are able to balance the things that you need to do at home, like maybe, for some of us who have very small children, it's a daycare drop-off or a daycare pickup in the middle of the day. Um, or others who just, you know, just want to jump on the Peloton and get a workout in in the middle of the day. You don't need to have permission and don't want to get permission to just do those things that need to happen during your day. Um, and, and the reality is we can trust our people, like Sheila said, to get their work done, to drive towards outcomes without having to manage every single hour, every single minute of the nine to five. And I think part of the narrative that gets woven out there is not just the fact that flexibility is all about location when actually time is more important. It's also gets woven around in this, there's choice or there's control. And the only two you know poles are, I've got choice, which is completely individualistic and everybody on their own or control top down mandates. When the truth is most people want something in the middle. The majority of that 80% that wants um, location flexibility, almost everyone in that 94% that wants schedule flexibility wants some overlap with their team. People want to come together, but they want it to be for a purpose. They want it to be for camaraderie, for relationship building as much as they want it for collaboration. On schedules, they want time when they know they can contact each other and they can be in sync on a daily basis, but they don't want it to be nine to five. So what we talk about a lot in the book is flexibility within a framework. Um, Salesforce does this as well with flex team agreements. We do it at Slack with team level agreements, making sure that every team has its own level of agreement about what those conditions look like, about why we come together as well as when we come together. So for our team, for example, we have core collaboration hours, 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. West Coast time are when we jam in all of our one-on-ones, our team meetings and our cross-functional meetings in order to make sure that we've got freedom and flexibility for people to do their individual work outside of that. And so that our team, which is spread across North America, doesn't end up with people who are on the East Coast dialing in repeatedly at six o'clock on the East Coast for a three o'clock in the afternoon California meeting. That type of constraint is sometimes hard for teams to initially put in place. It means some change in terms of how you think about your calendar, but it unlocks a lot of well-being. It unlocks a lot of stress reduction and it unlocks a lot of productivity from an employer perspective. And so the payback is really great on, on those kinds of concepts. Hybrid work. Employees want it, employers need it, and everyone has questions. When done right, facilitating flexible work can be a win-win for everyone happier employees, engaged teams, and better business outcomes, Robin is here to make the logistics easy. Our all-in-one workplace experience platform helps thousands of companies reimagine their approach to work. To learn more about how we make hybrid work work, visit robinpowered.com. And flexible within a framework also suggests this isn't one size fits all, even inside of your organization, even if it only has 100 people and 10 teams. And flexible within a framework also suggests this isn't a free for all, right? It isn't all or nothing. We're not all 100% independent and autonomous or all 100% functioning you know, under a mandate. What shows up for me is you're challenging some very powerful myths or beliefs 
that organizations have held on to about work, like time is money, right? This productivity mentality. How do we work through that? I mean, that's a powerful belief system. And, and I think it rules the way that corporate culture has operated for a long time. It's a time is money concept of the more time you spend at work, the more money that you'll make. Um, you know, I think we've all sat in performance conversations or promotion reviews where someone gets lauded for being the first in the last to leave. My first performance review of my career, I was, I, um, was complimented for responding to emails on my Blackberry, uh, at midnight. And that was a good thing. And I think that for so long, it was this person like deserves to get promoted because they have an amazing work ethic and they work all the time and their job defines their life versus this person creates a lot of value and these are the outcomes that they've created for our team, for our organization that warrants that promotion. And I think this is gonna be the most challenging shift or this is the most challenging shift for many leaders to embrace as we think about flexible work. It's measuring the outcomes rather than the activity, defining the impact, showing people what good looks like and giving them the autonomy to get there. A lot of these pieces are not necessarily natural for, for many leaders, but it's critical that we embrace them and start implementing them in conversations and feedback in order to develop a more equitable and inclusive work environment. Because what we've seen for so long is that this time is money, hustle till you make it culture has created a monoculture um, across the corporate ranks globally. It comes back down to trust, right? Which is what Sheila had brought up at the beginning of this discussion. It comes back down to trust. Um, and focusing on outcomes helps you be really clear on what the expectations are. And it, it moves you away from some of the things that we're hearing in the media around monitoring software and you know finding ways to check if people are online. and. The, the behaviors that result from that is more performative than actually driving towards more productivity um, and outcomes like you, what you actually want. One of my favorite quotes from a, a chief human resource officer to their CEO was, who was, you know, CEO keeps on asking, how do we know they're really working? Um, the question back was, how did you know they were working in the office? Um, there, there's not, you know, managing by attendance, managing by, you know, Joe comes in at 8 a.m., Joe leaves at 8 p.m. doesn't mean that Joe produces great outcomes. Rewarding Joe because he crushed his Q2, but he also crushed his Q1 is different from hours and attendance based type of things. And if, if there's one thing that can help us all, both business and individuals uh, across a wide spectrum of backgrounds, it's by focusing on outcomes because that's what we want uh, out of the business. It's a more level playing field in terms of how we reward people with opportunity, with promotions. And one of the things that comes up in our research time and again, every single quarter is that flexibility has disproportionate benefit for historically underrepresented groups. 60% of working moms in our latest version of the survey want to work from the office two days a week or less. That's up every quarter for the past year, basically. 50% of working dads want it too. So it's not that working dads don't want to want it. It's just the needs are clearly disproportionately falling on women with children than men with children, especially in the US and in the UK. Same thing is true when we look across race and ethnicity. Sense of belonging among black, Hispanic, Latinx, and Asian American uh, office workers actually has risen over the course of the pandemic. Initially, by the way, for white office workers, it fell while it rose for those other groups. And I, not having had that experience myself, was wondering where this is coming from. We got a group of academic experts together. Brian Lowry from Stanford was the first, first person to express it personally, that even as a black professor on Stanford's campus, he felt um, the cost of code switching, that five days a week, nine to five on campus was taxing for him. The ability to step in and step out of that uh, situation, to dial in and dial out of that, allowed him to recharge his batteries. And so the last two years, you can see it in our data, it gets reported on a lot. There are real benefits to diversity, equity, and inclusion when it comes to thinking about flexible work models. But the converse is also true. If we go back to what Sheila was describing, which is rewarding people on presenteeism, on attendance, that kind of proximity bias can really be destructive to diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. And that's why I take such issue with a lot of these phrases like quiet quitting or Get back to work, people. We have been working for the last two years. Um, but with quiet quitting, so much of it is that people are reevaluating the role of work in their lives. 
you know, prior to the pandemic, it was how is my life going to fit into my work? And now it's how is my work going to fit into my life? And by establishing those boundaries and also not subscribing to the old hustle culture, people are, are also voting with their feet. And I think it's really critical for people to recognize that this movement that's happening is that people are defining how they want to approach their work. And they're not necessarily going to sacrifice their health, their relationships with their friends, their family in order to achieve these notions of success. The pandemic presented a paradox based on what you're describing. We have data that tells us exactly how to diversify our organizations. We have data that tells us exactly how to navigate the great resignation. We have all the data that tells us what employees want or what constitutes a great experience and what they expect now. And yet we seem to be struggling to take action. That makes me think that there's a new definition of what it means to be an effective leader in this flexible within a framework environment. How would you describe the attributes that we need in leaders now to navigate and to take all of this data we have and put it into action to get to the outcomes you've been talking about? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll jump in first, um, but this is a, a big one for all three of us, so we should uh, feel free to jump in. But yes, um, I think the, the role of the manager has shifted so dramatically over the last decade, and even more so in the pandemic. Like we talked about, it's less about monitoring, less about task tracking and you know checking to see if you're clocking in at nine and clocking out at five, um, and more about being that empathetic coach, helping to really unlock the potential in your people, um, whether they are you know, extroverts, introverts, parent, non-parent, understanding some of those, the context and the background that they bring and creating that more inclusive environment so that people contribute to their very best and their best ideas. I think that shift in, in the role of a manager um, is something that is very near and dear to all three of us and something that I have always appreciated um, at Slack is that we we have this framework that I have um, that I love around what is the role of the manager now We're like what are the core responsibilities and it comes down to three things right one is to create clarity and that's around that like what are the expectations around outcomes two is to build trust because again, it comes down to trust and trust in your people. And third is, is exactly what I said, it was just unlocking potential um, and really understanding the context that people are bringing to work and their needs and their preferences and how do you bring that together in a team dynamic. Um, and, and so the three core responsibilities of managers, very different from monitoring, task tracking, um, and inputs. Yeah, I totally agree with what Helen just said. And, and so much of this is like, it's about empathy. It's about transparency. And I, I can say from my own experience, when I first became a manager, I thought that I needed to know all the answers. That that was my job was if someone had questions or pushback or input, like I'd figure it out and solve it and know all the answers. But now management is about getting more comfortable with transparency in the form of, I don't know, or I need your help, or we're figuring it out. And that's what we're seeing as a core expectation. And transparency is not just about um, sharing information. It's also about listening and getting information from your employees. We, we talk about that as two-way transparency. And what we've seen from our research is that those who don't feel like their, their leaders are being transparent with them around the future of work policies, they're three times more likely to look for a new job in the next year. And so this is a big part of the shift in terms of, of a leader from, go, from having all the answers from saying like, do as I say, to now being more, more transparent, getting feedback and iterating along the way. And, and what we've seen is that that shift is, is very difficult for many, understandably, because that's not necessarily how they've risen their ranks through their career. I was gonna build on that personally, I feel that. And I think that's a lot of the challenge is, you know, I've been leading and managing teams for 30 years. I've been a CEO of small companies. I've been an executive at a number of others. and. You know, as a successful leader, your attitude often gets baked in about, well, what worked for me is going to work for other people. And it turns out that's not right. 
<laughs> uh, what worked for you may have worked for you because of the time that you're in, the place that you're in, and who you were. And so understanding that people bring different perspectives to it, but also different challenges and the advantages that some of us have, I'm white and male, that we bring into this that are, that are different. Uh, what Sheila expressed, that whole um, transparency aspect and um, having all the answers. I had this phrase beaten into me early on in my career, seldom wrong, never in doubt. The part of my job was literally to be you know, the smartest person in the room and to, and to voice it. And it took me a decade plus to unlearn that as a manager. Um, part of the reason why I love this work is we're learning that there are better ways to lead and manage that are more human, that are more approachable, that work for more people, which has better outcomes for organizations. But we shouldn't discount the fact that change is hard, even if you're, uh, maybe sometimes, especially if you are a highly successful senior leader, because the environment around you has changed quietly but continuously for a couple of decades. And now you're faced with a world that you don't quite recognize where the tools you're bringing to it need to change. And what we're asking you to do really is two things. Still have that inspiration, that motivation, that vision setting skill that you've got that you were great at, but invite everybody to help you figure out the path. I know where we need to get to, but I don't know how we're gonna get there. And I need you to help me get there. And leaders who are doing that are really driving the kind of engagement of people as, as people in their organizations, not just the rallying cry, but, oh, you did hire me because I'm an adult for my brain, not just to go and do the work. And if you can accomplish that, you unlock a lot in terms of um, your team's bond. We all feel greater ownership of what we help to create. And we were talking about creating transparency. And when you're a part of coming up with the ideas, participating in the pilots, it's a brilliant strategy to help close that trust gap between employers and employees and have that transparency. And in your book, you say the most successful leaders will go much further than offering occasional remote work days. They will redesign every aspect of how work gets done from defining how they measure organizational success to training their managers, make it happen. And you have seven steps that you encourage organizations to take to move from these places of blending to places of belonging and from mandates to meaning what are the seven steps and how could listeners get started? The, the starting point, and I'll, I'll do the first two and then, and then Sheila, why don't you pick it up? Um, you can't start off with policies. Policies land really poorly with people. It's back to the treat them as adults. But starting with principles uh, and, and guardrails, you know, what's the purpose behind your organization? What is the purpose in, that you're trying to drive? And then what is your flexible work principles? For us, it is flexibility. We believe people can do their best work when they have the flexibility to work where and when they're at their best. It's inclusion that we need to create a level playing field for people from an opportunity standpoint to advance, to grow, to learn, and connection. We do believe it's important to bring people together to build connections and relationships, but you also build connection through digital and virtual experiences that you build together and how you build uh, that connection through transparency. Starting off there is really important. And then the next question that always comes up with is that's great, but how do I figure out like the rules of the road? And that's where T-Mobile agreements come into play. How do I think about how different parts of your organization and teams find the right balance point in terms of not only where and when they work, but how they work together. And the how questions within those T-Mobile agreements are actually the most important ones. How do you make decisions? How do you um, work together becomes more important. So those are the, the first couple of steps. Yes, I think that um, as you develop those team level agreements, have those principles and there's those guardrails, it's also critical to remember that like this is not roll it out and everything is good to go. Taking the mindset of experimentation, as I mentioned earlier, is super important. And, and we write a lot about how, how to actually experiment how to get feedback from people on your team. How do you measure success? So that's one piece. And also acknowledging, um, I had a conversation earlier today with a few real estate professionals who are worried about what the role of the office is. And going digital first does not mean that the office is dead. Instead, it takes on a new meaning. And what we see from our research is that those who wanna come back into the office periodically wanna do so to foster camaraderie and, and cultivate connection. So there's an opportunity to redesign what the office looks like in order to help foster that trust, that culture, that connection between people. It's also about investing in digital tools that will help people connect 
over the course of a given day uh, between the times that they see each other in person. And I, I want to leave a couple for, for Helen, but I think it's really important to Helen's point to also just acknowledge, this is my favorite step, um, the importance of reskilling managers and shifting them from gatekeepers to empathetic coaches. And we talk a lot in that chapter about the need for coaching, structured feedback, as well as celebrating those who are doing their jobs effectively to set the model for the broader organization. And, um, and I think that all of these steps, they don't necessarily have to be taken in chronological order. It's based on where a company is and they can figure out where they need to start in order to, to get to their flexible work. Why? The reality is that this is a loop that, you know, you start with principles and guardrails, you go through, work through some team level agreements, experiment, build some foundations, but it's, it's circular. You come back and you say, you know, where is the context that we're operating at now? How are we doing? What are we learning? How does that continue to trickle down? And how do we evolve this blueprint for the future of work for our organization over time? Um, as people are shifting into more hybrid, for example, a bit of that changes. And so um, it's not linear. And it, yes, this is an opportunity to redesign everything uh, from the beginning. We have a blank slate, but also it shouldn't feel so daunting. Like there are small, easy things that managers and leaders can do to take that first step forward, to rethink meetings, to sit down and write a team level agreement, um, which can start with just documenting what have we been doing and what has been working. Let's start there because the reality is we've been doing a lot of this over the last two and a half years and there are lessons learned and we had to recognize that. Excellence and effectiveness have no finish line to cross. That's how I think about what you were saying. and. And now imagine that we are all gathered together around a water cooler because people say they miss this about the office. Spontaneous conversation, which means they need to learn about Slack Donut where you can just randomly get introduced to people in your own organization. So maybe Slack Donut connected us. This is our lightning round for listeners to get to know you. Helen, what time of day do you do your best work? Very, very early in the morning like 6 a.m. in the morning, before the kids get up. Before the kids get up and before the core collaboration hours that Brian talked about. So uh, Brian, for you, if you could do any job in the world, what would you be doing? Stage manager, musical theater stage manager. That is awesome. I cannot wait to see your show on Broadway. It's, it's, super, it's super specific and a little, bit, a little bit obscure, yeah. It feeds my ADD. It puts on a show, the emotional context of it. It's, uh, it's just a fantastic job that I had once upon a time in college and loved. Sheila, what is the part of your daily routine that you most look forward to each day? I would say that is the hardest part of my daily routine, but it's also the most fun is um, I take my kids to school every morning on our electric bike. So uh, I wake them up, get them breakfast, and then we jump on a bright orange bike and ride to school, and I get to hang out with fellow parents, get to hang out with them before they start their days in the classroom. And uh, there are some days where it goes really well, like this morning. There are other days where we are speeding to school at, at uh, pretty unsafe, you know, unsafe speeds, but it's still a lot of fun, and it's, it's uh, time that I treasure with them every single day. Thanks to you, there's now background music in my head that's playing like bicycle, bicycle, I want to ride my bicycle. So thank you, Queen, and thank you, <laughs> Sheila. You're welcome. And then a closing question that I'll have each of you answer, Helen, Brian, and then Sheila. Imagine for just a moment now that there are 25 hours in every day rather than 24. How will you spend your extra hour, Helen? Um, extra hour, taking a walk through the park with my dog, listening to something, anything. But that's probably, by an extra hour, I would do that every day. Brian. I will confess my sleep habits kind of stink, so I'm going to get a little extra sleep. Ariana Huffington would be proud of you, Brian. What about you, Sheila? Yeah. So I read this book um, called Time Management for Mortals a few months ago, and it talks a lot about atallic versus talic activities. And I, I think it's atallic activities are essentially activities you just do for yourself. You go for a walk, not to get more steps or to go to the grocery store, but just to go for a walk. 
And so I've been trying to find more activities um, that I'm doing just for myself. And so I would use that extra day to just read and and probably read like novels rather than uh, rather than business books. As we close, how can listeners stay connected with you, find your book and the great research you continue to launch? Yes. So the book is called How the Future Works for all of our research and more information about the book. Uh, follow futureforum.com. Follow us on Twitter at Future Forum. Uh, or on LinkedIn. And you can follow us all individually as well on those two platforms. Choose to challenge the myths of where work happens, when work happens, and how the future works. Thank you to Brian, Sheila, and Helen for showing us how to do the best work of our lives today on Success From Anywhere. Because success is not a destination, success is not a location. Success is available to anyone anywhere at any time. Thanks so much for listening. Make it a great day.